We are making our way through the book of Amos, and we come this morning to Amos chapter 4. We have all seen young children run towards a trusted adult. Perhaps it's a, a parent or a grandparent or a, a family friend. And the child runs towards that adult. And what does the adult do? The adult extends their arms and holds out their hands for the child to run into. The prophet Amos lived and preached around the same time as the prophet Isaiah. And there was a time when the Lord spoke through the prophet Isaiah about his relationship with the people of Israel. And this is what he said about his relationship with the people of Israel. All day long, I have held out my hands to an obstinate people. All day long, I have held out my hands to an obstinate people. You find that in Isaiah chapter 65 and verse 2, and it's quoted also in the New Testament, Romans chapter 10 and verse 21. Well, what a picture that is. What a picture it is of the, the compassion of God towards disobedient people. The compassion of God towards sinful people. All day long, he holds out his hands towards them. He holds out his hands to them and says, come to me. He holds out his hands towards sinful people and he says, turn from your sins and, and turn to me. We, we are not told what, what he did with his hands as he said it. But in our minds... We can perhaps picture Jesus Christ holding out his hands and saying to sinful and struggling people, come to me. All you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. And right now, this morning, as we as we meet together, the Lord Almighty holds out his hands to you. And he says to you, come to me. Turn to me. And yet, the theme of Amos chapter 4 is that when the Lord God Almighty held out his hands to the people of Israel all those years ago, they did not come. They did not come. And as the Lord holds out his hands to you this morning, will you come to him? Well, let's make our way through this, this chapter. And the first thing we see is that the Lord holds out his hands to people who have turned from him. The Lord holds out his hands to people who have turned from him. We, we, we see that in the first five verses of the chapter. The, the chapter begins with, with the Lord speaking directly to, to some of the women of Israel. Hear this word, you, you cows of Bashan on Mount Samaria, you women who oppress the poor and crush the needy. 
and say to your husbands, bring us some drinks. The, the, the Lord likens these women of Israel in, in the days of Amos to, to, to the cows of Bashan. But Bashan was an area known for having lots of grass. An area where, where the cattle could, could graze and feed. The cows of Bashan were, were known as being well fed and, and healthy. In Psalm 22, where the, the psalmist speaks of being surrounded by his, his enemies. Psalm 22 that, that takes us to Jesus Christ and his, his death upon the cross. In Psalm 22 and verse 12. We read, many bulls surround me, strong bulls of, of Bashan encircle me. The bulls, that the cattle of Bashan were known as being well fed and, and strong and healthy. And the Lord God likens that the women of, of Samaria to, to well fed cattle. Like well-fed cattle, these women enjoyed plenty. But as they do, did so, they oppressed the poor and they crushed the needy. Hear this, you cows of Bashan on Mount Samaria, you women who oppress the poor and crush the needy. They, they, they were ruthless women. Ruthless women who, who trampled on the poor and the needy in order to get what they wanted. And having got what they wanted, they, they told their husbands to, to bring them some drinks. You women who oppress the poor and crush the needy and say to your husbands, bring us some drinks. These women that the Lord speaks to here, they, they, they spent their days trampling on the poor so they could make money. And they spent their evenings spending that money in the wine bar. And the Lord said that he would judge and punish them. In the previous chapter, chapter 3 and verse 11, he said, an enemy will overrun the land. He will pull down your strongholds and plunder your fortresses. And, and now in verses 2 and 3, he, he says, what will happen to these, to these women who oppress the poor and crush the needy when, when that happened? The time will surely come when you will be taken away with hooks, the last of your fish hooks. You will each go straight out through breaks in the wall and you will be cast out towards Harmon. The Lord said that when the enemy nation invaded Israel, these women would be dragged out of the city walls like fish caught in a fish hook. It's, it's powerful language, isn't it? And then having spoken to some of the women of Israel, the Lord goes on in verses 4 and 5 to, to speak of the worship of the people of Israel. Go to Bethel and sin. Go to Gilgal and sin yet more. Bring your sacrifices every morning, your tithes every three years. Burn leavened bread as a thank offering and brag about your free will offerings. Boast about them, you Israelites, for this is what you love to do, declares the sovereign Lord. Even as these women, and no doubt many men, fattened themselves and trampled on the poor and the needy. They continued to go to Bethel and Gilgal. They, they continued to go to these sites of, of worship and, and offer their sacrifices to the Lord. And they, they boasted and bragged about the, the sacrifices, the, the, the worship they, they brought to the Lord. And they assumed that because of what they did when they went to, to Bethel and, and to Gilgal, that, that, that everything was well. Everything was well with, with their souls. And then having gone to, to Bethel and Gilgal and offered their, their sacrifices, they, they went back to trampling upon the poor and, and enjoying their drinks. They, they were like people today 
who, who might go to church and sing in the congregation, it is well, it is well with my soul. And then spend the rest of the week with, with little thought for God. Living for self, li living for money, living for the, the things of this world. And the Lord said that even as they worshipped, they were sinning against him. Verse 4, go to Bethel and sin. Go to Gilgal and sin yet more. The Lord says, even as you bring your, your sacrifices and your, your offerings to me, you're, you're, you're sinning. Because those sacrifices and those, those offerings that you, you bring to me, they're, they're, they're not real. You're, you're, you're not living a life of, of worship to me. There has always been and always will be the, the idea in the minds of some people that they can, they can live as they like. Uh, as long as they go to church and do their duty to God once a week. And then all is well. And yet the Lord says that when people continue in their sin, when they continue on a, on a sinful path, And even their worship of him is sinful and unacceptable to him. Listen to what the Lord said in the next chapter. It's, again, very powerful language that the Lord says to these people, the, the people of Israel, of their worship. In, in chapter 5 and verse 21, I hate, I despise your religious feasts. I, I cannot stand your assemblies. Even though you bring me burnt offerings and grain offerings, I will not accept them. Though you bring choice fellowship offerings, I will have no regard for them. Away with the noise of your songs. I will not listen to the music of your harps. And in verse 2, here in chapter 4, that the Lord swears by his holiness. The Lord has sworn by his holiness. The time will surely come when you will be taken away with, with hooks. The last of you with fish hooks. The Lord is holy. He is pure. He is separate from, from all that is sinful. And he, he speaks to the people of Israel of their sin. And he swears. He swears that he will punish it. And yet, yet, our second point is this. The Lord holds out his hands to such people and calls them to return to him. He holds out his hands to, to these people and calls them to return to him. These people who are fattening themselves and, and oppressing the poor and the needy. These people who were just going through the, the motions of, of worship, but were living godless lives. God reaches out his hands to them and he says, come to me, turn to me. And we see that in verses 6 to 11. In, in verses 6 to 11, the, the Lord looks back and he lists five different troubles that he sent upon the Israelites. Things that he sent upon them at, at different points during the, their life as a nation. He says in verse 6, he, he speaks of a time when he, he sent a lack of food upon them. I gave you empty stomachs, he says, in every city and lack of bread in every town. 
Then in verses 7 and 8, he, he speaks of a time when he withheld rain from them. I, I also withheld rain from you. When the harvest was still three months away, I sent rain on one town, but withheld it from another. One field had rain, another had none, and dried up. People staggered from town to town for water, but did not get enough to drink. Then in verse 9, he speaks of a time when he sent disease upon the their fruit and crops. Many times I struck your gardens and vineyards. I struck them with blight and mildew. Locusts devoured your fig tree and olive trees. And in verse 10, he speaks of times when he sent plagues and death upon them. I sent plagues upon you as I did to Egypt. I killed your young men with a sword along with your captured horses. I filled your nostrils with the stench of your camps. And then in verse 11, he, he speaks of a time when in some way that is not described, he, he overthrew some of the people of Israel as he overthrew Sodom and Gomorrah. And yet he, he saved some of them. I overthrew some of you as I overthrew Sodom and Gomorrah, yet you were like a burning stick snatched from the fire. And the Lord speaks of, he, he lists these, these five different occasions when he sent trouble upon the, the people of Israel. Uh, and each time he says, I did it. I did it. I gave you empty stomachs. I withheld the rain. I struck your gardens. I sent plagues. I overthrew you. We, we, we see the Lord's sovereignty in these things, the, the, the Lord's sovereignty in all things. None of these things that, that came upon the, the people of Israel just came by, by chance or, or by accident. The, the, the Lord did it. The, the, the Lord ruled over all of these things. The Lord rules over all things. All those events that happened then, all, all events that, that happen now, that the Lord rules over all, is, is sovereign over all. But not only is the Lord's sovereignty impressed upon us here, but so, so is the Lord's mercy, the Lord's compassion. He, he lists these, these five troubles that he sent upon Israel. And at the end of each one of them, he says the same thing. Verse 6, I gave you empty stomachs and so on. Yet you have not returned to me, declares the Lord. Verse 7, I also withheld rain from you, and so on. Yet you have not returned to me, declares the Lord. Verse 9, many times I struck your gardens and vineyards, and so on. Yet you have not returned to me, declares the Lord. Verse 10, I sent plagues among you, as I did to Egypt. Yet you have not returned to me, declares the Lord. Verse 11, I overthrew some of you as I overthrew Sodom and Gomorrah. Yet you have not returned to me, declares the Lord. What was the Lord's purpose in sending all of these troubles upon Israel? He, he sent these troubles in his mercy. He sent these troubles in order to make them stop, in order to make them think. He sent these troubles upon them so that they would be aware of their weakness, aware of their sinfulness, aware of their foolishness. He sent these troubles upon them so that they would return to him. As the Lord God sent these troubles upon the people of Israel, he, he did so with his hands held out to them, saying to them, return to me, come to me, Turn from your sins. Come to me. Believe in me. Be saved. But again and again, he says, I did this, yet you have not returned to me. They so loved their sinful ways that they continued in them. 
rather than return to the Lord. Now, I mentioned in the first message we had on the book of Amos that it was, it was reading this chapter in my, my daily readings some months ago that I was just struck by the, the, the relevance of the book of Amos to, to our present situation. You know, couldn't something similar be said of our nation in the light of events in recent years? Over the past few years, many testing things have happened, haven't they, in the, the life of our nation? We've, we've gone through Brexit. We've had the, the COVID pandemic. We've had the, the cost of living crisis. We've, we've had the death of the Queen. We've had a succession of different prime ministers. Somebody even said to me a few days ago, well, what's happening with the weather in our country? And could the Lord say to, to our nation, what he said to the people of Israel then? Could the Lord say to our nation, I've sent all these things upon you, yet you have not returned to me? We, we, we prayed, didn't we, during the pandemic, we prayed often that it would result in people turning to the Lord. And, and perhaps some did. But it didn't happen on a, a large scale, did it? But of course, it's, it's easy, isn't it, to read a passage like this and all these things that have happened, yet you have not returned to me. And it's easy to say, well, society out there, all these things have happened and, and society has not returned to the Lord. But can we bring it closer to home? What about the people of God within our nation? What about the the churches of, of our land. Could it be that the Lord could say to us, I, I've brought all these things upon you in recent years, yet you've not returned to me. Have these events of recent years that we've gone through caused us to, to humble ourselves before the Lord? Have they caused us to confess our sin and weakness to the Lord? Have they caused us to turn to the Lord and seek him more earnestly than we did before? Have they caused us to pray that the Lord would come in mercy and, and revive his work? Have these events caused us to, to desire and look forward to and pray more earnestly for, for the return of the Lord Jesus Christ? Lord holds out his hands all day long. I've held out my hands, he says. He holds out his hands and he says, come to me, return to me. And that leads us to a third point. The Lord holds out his hands so the people will meet with him. The Lord holds out his hands so the people will, will meet with him. The, the, the chapter ends that the with the last verse, verse 13, by, by telling us who God is, what God is like. It's a, it's a wonderful um, description of the, the glory of God. He who forms the mountains, creates the wind, and reveals his thoughts to man. He who turns dawn to darkness and treads the high places of the earth. The Lord God Almighty is his name. What a description that is of God. The, the Lord God Almighty. The, the Lord of hosts. The, the Lord of armies. He forms the mountains. He, he creates the wind. 
He, he's over all that happens upon earth. He, he treads the high places of the earth. And do and, and, and you notice one of the lines in the middle of that verse? As it speaks about this great and glorious God who, who formed the mountains and rules over all things, it says in the middle of verse 13 that he reveals his thoughts to man. <laughs> this great and glorious God reveals his thoughts to men and women. Isn't that a, an amazing thing? A few years ago, I, I read about somebody who had been invited to play a round of golf with Donald Trump. And it, he was president at the time. And this man was invited to, to play a round of golf with President Trump. And a little while afterwards, he was interviewed by, by some journalists. And they, they all wanted to know about it. And, and one of them said, what, what, what did you talk about? What, what, what did you talk about while you were playing golf with, with the president? And this man said, well, we... We talked about golf. <laughs> he said, we, we, we didn't talk about foreign policy. We, we didn't talk about economic policy. The, the president didn't reveal any state secrets. He didn't share any state secrets with, with this man. And yet the Lord God Almighty reveals his thoughts to men. <laughs> And how does he do that? How does God reveal his thoughts to us? Well, he, he does it through his word. He does it through the Bible. He, he did it through prophets like Amos and Isaiah. And he does it supremely through his son, Jesus Christ. Hebrews chapter 1. In the past, God spoke to our forefathers through the prophets at many times and in various ways. But in these last days, he has spoken to us by his Son. And why does God do this? Why does God reveal his thoughts to us? Why, why does God speak to us in his word? He does it so we will be prepared to meet him. Verse 12. This is what I will do to you, Israel. Because I will do this to you. Prepare to meet your God, O Israel. This God who's described in Verse 13, prepare to meet him. The, the Lord told the Israelites in Amos Day to, to prepare to meet with God. And he tells us to prepare to meet with God. To prepare for what lies ahead. To prepare for, for what is coming. Now we, we all know that it's, it's good and important to, to prepare for things. There's an old saying, isn't there? Fail to prepare, prepare to fail. If a sportsman doesn't prepare for their match, if a teacher doesn't prepare their lesson, if a preacher doesn't prepare his sermon, it's, it's not going to end well for them. And why would it be any different? When it comes to meeting with God. Prepare to meet your God. If, if you don't prepare to meet with God, then it, it's not going to end well for you. We, we, we will all meet with God. We, we cannot avoid that. We, 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 we learn, don't we, how to avoid meeting some people, you know, we, you, you walk along the road and you see someone else coming along. Well, we, we all know how to, you know, cross the road, don't we? If we, if we want to avoid meeting that, that person, but we, we cannot avoid meeting God. None of us can avoid that. Some of the statements of, of the Scripture. Hebrews 
9.25. It is appointed unto man once to die, and after that, the judgment. Romans chapter 14 and, and verse 10. We will all stand before God's judgment seat. 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 10. We must all appear before the judgment seat of, of Christ. We, we will all meet with God. We, we'll all meet with God on, on that day. On, on that day that he, he judges the world. That he, he judges the living and the dead. None of us can avoid that, that meeting. It is the one meeting that, that none of us can avoid. And the Lord says to us, Pre prepare. To pre prepare to meet your God. How, how do you do that? How do you prepare for meeting with God on the day of judgment? Well, the answer to that really is, is simple. You prepare for meeting with God on the day of judgment by meeting with him now. By meeting with him now. You, you don't have to wait until the day of judgment to meet with God. You, you, you don't have to meet him for the first time on that day as a judge who condemns. But, but you, can, you can come to him and, and meet him now. As a gracious saviour and father. That's two questions. Where do you meet with him? And how do you meet with him? If you're to prepare to meet with God on the day of judgment, if... If you're to, to prepare for that by meeting with him now, where, where are you going to meet with him and how are you going to meet with him? Well, let's answer those two questions. Where do you meet with him? There's, there, there's only one place that you can meet with him. There, there, there's only one place that you can, can meet with God. And, and whenever people go to that place, they, they find him there. They, they find him there with, with his hands held out. That place, that only place where, where you can meet with God is, is Calvary. The, the cross where, where God's son, Jesus Christ, died. You meet him at that place where Jesus Christ paid the price for sin. The, the, the only place where, where your sin can be, can be washed away and forgiven. If you're to, to meet with God and, and be prepared for, for the day of judgment to come, you, you have to meet him at Calvary. You, you, you have to go to the cross. You have to go to a, a crucified saviour and, and put your faith in him. But then how? How do you meet with him? Well, you, you run... Like that child we mentioned right at the beginning, you run into the arms of the one whose hands are held out all day long. I've held out my hands, he says. And you run to him. You, you run to those hands. You, you run to those arms. The, the Lord Jesus spoke about the, the prodigal son. The, the prodigal son went, home, went, went far from home. Far away from his father. He went to a far country where he wasted his money. He wasted his life on, on sinful living. And one day that, that prodigal son came to his senses. And he left that far country behind. And he returned to his father. And he wasn't sure what, what he was going to find. He wasn't sure what to expect when he returned to his father. And what did he find? He found that his father's arms were held out towards him. His father was holding out his hands for him. And he ran into those arms. And his father wrapped those arms around him. 
And like the prodigal son, you meet with God by, by leaving your, your sin behind, by, by turning from your sin and, and running to him. Running to him and, and trusting in Jesus Christ who died upon the cross. And his hands are held out to you calling you to, to come to him, to return to him. And do not then, do not be like the people to whom Amos preached. The people of whom the Lord said, all day long I've held out my hands to you, yet you have not Return to me. Don't be like that. 